Doubtlessly, one of the most controversial historical witnesses of Beethoven's life is Anton Schindler, the first Beethoven biographer. In case you have never heard of Schindler before, Anton Schindler was born in 1795 in a little village in what today is part of Czech Republic. He studied violin with his father and came to Vienna in 1813 to study law. He probably met Beethoven for the first time somewhat later when working as a law clerk in the office of Beethoven's attorney Johann Baptist Bach. September 1822, Schindler became concertmaster of the new orchestra of the theater in der Josefstadt in Vienna. The new building of the theater was inaugurated by a composition of Beethoven, the Ouverture Die Weihe des Hauses, conducted by the composer himself. From that time until May 1824, Schindler was part of the inner circle around Beethoven, taking care of all kinds of things practically and financially. He would call himself Beethoven's secretary. In May 1824, he took part in the secret plans for a premiere in Vienna of the Ninth Symphony against Beethoven's will and was banned from his life by a furious composer together with some other people. But in December 1826, Schindler apparently was forgiven for his sins and from that moment on up to Beethoven's death he again took care of the composer who by that time already was very ill. Anton Schindler, though not unsuccessful as a musician, probably would not have played the role he played in musical life of that time if it weren't for his connections to the illustrious composer. As proud as he obviously was on his relationship with Beethoven, it might have frustrated him in a way as well as it may not have helped him hiding his somewhat irritating character he apparently possessed. Schindler wanted to take ownership of Beethoven's legacy perhaps a bit too much and for sure a bit too much alone. In 1840 he wrote the very first biography of Beethoven, 13 years after the composer's death. The biography was translated into English in an edition, of which I have here the American first edition, that's really worth your time, since no one less than Ignaz Moscheles added several detailed comments to that translation. Schindler expanded his biography two more times, with the last edition published in 1860, of which I have here the first German edition. And that's the edition that's been translated into English in 1966. Reading Schindler's works today is not something that can be considered to be a straightforward activity. At one hand, it is in his biography that we find details on Beethoven's life that we cannot find anywhere else. On the other hand, Schindler seemed to have blown up his connection to Beethoven and perhaps even his knowledge on the composer's life in some instances where facts certainly overlap with some fantasy. Seeing the context in which he had to write his biography, it shouldn't surprise us perhaps too much that some of the facts, like dates, names, places, certainly in Beethoven's earlier life, need correction. We should not forget, Schindler had to relate on witnesses that he oftentimes not knew personally, people giving him information about events that happened long time ago. And so it indeed is all but suspicious that the biography written in these circumstances contains some facts that we today can correct and actually have corrected. But sometimes Schindler seemed to be a bit too much on the defense for Beethoven. He for sure wanted to paint a picture of the composer without too much of the troubling colors of his life. He took a position even against musicians like Czerny and Marshallis, both prime sources regarding to Beethoven's life, and that attitude of almost convulsively maintaining the position of the true and only real authoritative Beethoven source, and not accepting any bad word of the master either, certainly has damaged his reputation more than was necessary. But Schindler must have been a bit blind for that damaged reputation he built for himself. A reputation that he did not care about perhaps too much since, after all, he was one of the prime sources for Beethoven until his death in 1864. Very few people mid-19th century could present the same credentials he had, and so the generations that came after him already in the 19th century developed a picture of Schindler that perhaps not always gave enough credit to what the man really had achieved towards Beethoven's legacy. Now, fast forward to today, the musicological landscape around Anton Schindler still seems to be troubled. 
He belongs to that category of which we apparently accept without much fact-checking any accusation of being a forger, an unreliable and untrustworthy source. And thus every time Schindler is inconvenient to the position we want to take today, musical society decides it is him to be the one who is not correct. That's a pity, since a lot of what Anton Schindler writes about Beethoven's performance practice might not correlate always with the way we play his music today, but contains, at least to me, by times very authentic elements. Schindler, in his biography, shares extremely detailed information on how Beethoven would have played his piano sonatas op. 14, played by the composer in his presence, for example, gives insights in how his sonata pathétique should be played, his symphonies, he underlines many times the importance to Beethoven of the correct tempi for his compositions, and many things more. I will present you in coming videos some of that information that you might wish had seen before, but for now, I want to look into one of the strongest crimes Schindler has been accused from for 150 years now. So to put this a little bit into context, from 1818 onwards, Beethoven always carried little notebooks with him. As his hearing worsened, he asked people to write their questions down, questions to which he replied orally. But the little books also contain information on personal reminders, his housekeeping, items he should buy, books that have been published, even, but that's rare, a few notes about a new composition. Beethoven kept this notebook habit until his death, so no surprise, these notebooks contain invaluable information of the composer's daily life. 139 of such notebooks have been preserved. 137 of them for decades were in the possession of our friend Anton Schindler. In 1846 he sold them to the Berlin Royal Library and since then they are object of detailed study. It is not hard to imagine what a gigantic puzzle they represent, only to give an approximate date to the thousands of pages is almost an impossible task. Messages scribbled together in pencil by hundreds of different hands, of which none had the intention to write something down for history. The first serious attempt to bring Beethoven's history on a higher level of comprehension after Schindler was done by the American researcher Alexander Wilox Thayer. Thayer, born in 1817, came to Europe, especially with a focus on reconstructing Beethoven's life. Still, today his biography is among the standard works written on the great composer's life. And one of the first sources for him, obviously, were the conversation notebooks that, by the time he first came to Europe, were only a few years publicly available in the Berlin Library. And of course, he visited Schindler as well, more specifically on 19th and 20th October 1854. And there starts one of the biggest misconceptions that has cast a shadow until today on the importance of Schindler's work. Thayer, native English speaker who learned German only with the purpose to study Beethoven's life, came back from Schindler almost totally perplexed. Schindler would have told him that only about 400 conversation books had survived and had been in his possession. Thayer must have been shocked, since in the Royal Library there only were 137 conversation books preserved. A logical conclusion to him was that Schindler had destroyed at least 223 of them. Indeed, looking to the pile of preserved notebooks, there is a period missing of about two to three years. And so this statement helped build the narrative of Schindler as a forger and a destroyer of Beethoven's legacy even. And Anton Schindler probably thanks to the way he acted or reacted constantly against his colleagues, could not count on too many defenders. And so, until today, this assumed act of brutality suffices to condemn the man as a 100% unreliable source. I'm far from an authority on this field, but when I first learned about this terrible gender crime of having destroyed such invaluable information, my first reaction was, why someone like him would do such thing? A brilliant recent article written by Theodor Albrecht confirms he in fact did not. The article of Albrecht, written in 2010, is linked below in the description box and has a telling title Anton Schindler as destroyer and forger of Beethoven's conversation books, a case for decriminalization. This article is a must read.
The level of details the author presents to make his case is stunning. The way he calls out the current establishment and scholars, even on the level of Barry Cooper, is stunning as well. No one cared or cares anymore about what Schindler's editor had written a few years before Thayer's visit in the preface of the second edition of the biography. In that text, we can read that 138, so not the 400 Thayer mentions, of the conversation notebooks were in the possession of Professor Schindler. Exactly the number of Schindler had sold to the Berlin Library. And Albrecht, the author of the mentioned article, suggests that Schindler, in his German conversation with Thayer, probably had shared the information that he possessed viel über 100 of these notebooks, which Thayer, as an American, has understood as 400, 400, instead of viel über 100, so much over 100. The holes in the chronology make it possible to say with relative certainty that only about 40 of such notebooks might be missing. He gives a logical solution to the reason why they disappeared, but I don't want to spoil the plot of a story that's a must read for you anyway. More important to mention here is the fact that since the day Thayer publicly suspected Schindler for having destroyed hundreds of these invaluable notebooks, Scholars have been copying that statement without fact-checking themselves for the story to be true. The explanation that Schindler wanted to reshape Beethoven to a higher moral standard than the conversation books might picture him, to me came across always as a weak argument, since the surviving books reveal still much of that vulnerable, often misunderstood man. And so, if Schindler's main goal really was to alter the way we would look back to Beethoven, why not destroying all information at once? Certainly, after Peter Stadlin in the 70s quite opportunistically had called out Schindler to be a forger for the terrible crime of having made some errors in annotations he added into the conversation books, even apparently had filled in some blank pages decades after Beethoven's death, which he perhaps not should have been doing, fact-checking Schindler seemed to be completely unnecessary since. Barry Cooper, one of the Beethoven authorities today, for instance, called Schindler the chief scoundrel, writing, and I quote, Schindler related in his biography a large number of stories about Beethoven and his music, but most have proved to be either completely or partly false. He even inserted numerous entries in Beethoven's conversation books after the composer's death in order to enhance his own reputation. Anything reported by Schindler must be assumed to be doubtful or false unless supported by independent evidence, in which case Schindler's contribution is redundant." End of quote. We must realize, and someone of the status as Barry Cooper even more than all of us combined, that the truth, certainly on reconstruction of past times, never comes in black and white statements. Since yes, if Barry Cooper writes something like we've quoted, a whole legion of students will repeat that until eternity. And more problematic even, when someone would want to correct statements like this, or hold them at the minimum against the light of historical facts, how often do we see the academic world react in a defensive way, defensive towards the people who seem to have a status and based solely on the position are given perhaps a bit too much the benefit of the doubt. Now, it's not my intention to call someone like Cooper or anyone else out for what they claim of have published, though the author of the article mentioned here is rather hard in his judgment. Indeed, one cannot escape after reading the facts and figures given in this article that someone of his status should have done a better job than just copying statements that go back over 150 years. And don't get me wrong here. I have not the intention to make you approach Schindler's work uncritical, as I do not have the intention to give you the impression that approaching Schindler's work in a critical way is something we easily can do. It requires more than just willingness. And in a world ruled more and more by opinions over slow research, experience and excellence, creating a new black and white position is done easier than one would wish for sometimes. We must think for ourselves from the awareness of where our knowledge and experience starts and more so where it stops. Articles like this one teach you just that. But as the truth never will be black and white, even not when a recognized researcher as Cooper would want us to believe in this case, Schindler remains one of the closest sources to Beethoven we have. 
And as we will see in some future videos, we can benefit from the awareness that indeed he, contrary to all of us today on this planet, truly has known Beethoven, spoke to him, listened to him, knew the sound of his voice, to just name one detail. And approaching his writings, even with a few drops of simple logical thinking, will produce some stunning insights. As for instance on the WBMP, or the whole beat metronome practice. Schindler might be the only source we need to truly understand the way Beethoven used his metronome, but that is for another time, soon. I promise, if you do not want to miss that golden story, do subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. Don't forget to hit the bell as well, so YouTube can notify you for future updates and become part of this musical movement by becoming an authentic sound insider at patreon.com. You'll find a strong community there, my personal practicing sessions and insight updates as well. Link below and in the description box. Thanks for watching and see you soon again. Bye.